And bang. After 38 years, this week is Dale Hansen's last sportscast at WFAA. And we're going unplugged to say goodbye, Delka style. Get your popcorn ready. <laughs> I knew what Dale Hansen is, uh, unfortunately. A Hall of Fame talent with a Pop Warner brain. Just look where snappy riding like that and an old Hawaiian shirt will get you. People in my business remember all the Cowboys staff. Unbelievable. I did not, I did not do that. I asked the question. His dearest friends and former colleagues will join us to share heartfelt remembrances of the man who reinvented local sports casting. I'm having a little trouble giving Cowboys owner Jerry Jones credit for fixing the mess he himself created. People say I'm arrogant, controversial. We sat down and I said, look, I think it's totally fair for me to tell you that I really don't like you. We did it our way, baby! We did it! Oh, hey, hey. These moments are the soundtrack of our sports lives. The Dallas Stars! They've won the Stanley Cup! Mavericks fans have waited 26 years for this night. I like opinionated people. At the oh, end know. of the day, it is yeah, my I would show. tell you it's my team, right? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, we hold our breath one last time. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pete Delkus. And don't worry, I know what you're thinking. I'm not interrupting our regular programming for severe weather. I'm the host of the Dale Hansen Show tonight. This week, Dale Hansen is doing his final sportscast at WFAA. Dale's been at my side for over 16 years here. Actually, only four if you include all of his vacation time, but, but I digress. But seriously, I hope this night would never come because working with Dale has been a wild ride and a highlight of my career. It's been like a big brother, some nights like a crazy uncle. We've truly had some great times together and made a lot of fun memories. Over the next hour, we're going to explore Dale's career and hear from some of the iconic sports celebrities he has featured in his sportscast and sports special. People like Mark Cuban, Barry Switzer, Barry Switzer, Sean, are we having Barry Switzer here? No? Okay. okay, I didn't think so. No Barry Switzer. But we do have a lot planned for you. And for those of you who haven't been here for all or even most of the last 38 years, this show is especially for you. Dallas-Fort Worth has nearly tripled in size since Dale arrived here in 1983, and that evolution is reflected in Dale Hansen, the most evolutionary sportscaster on the planet. As the late news approaches on a chilly Dallas night before we'd ever experienced social distancing, Dale Hansen is taking the pulse of his fans. Within minutes, he'll be on the air, solving the world's most vexing problems in the simplest language. If you're wondering how a sportscaster can become a guardian of social consciousness, well, you've missed one of his human truths, that appearances obscure rather than reveal our essence. North Texas was not ready for those lessons 38 years ago taxi. when Dale took a 10 block taxi ride from KDFW to WFAA, a trip that redefined local news. Where to, buddy? Channel 8. Dallas in the 80s was a wild and crazy place. Put on your red shoes and dance the blues. The clubs are just booming. You go out, you hang out with one another. He is so dreamy. You did actually kind of plan your Sunday night about watching, you know, his show because you just wanted to see what this animal was going to come with. Hanson's Sports Special. Hello, everybody. We do sport from here on Sunday night now, and it runs a little Tom bit Landry is actually Superman. <sighs> do you think it's possible that Tom Landry is actually Superman? I know what you're saying. This is an incredible story. Dale was a clown when he was at Channel 4. What was it like the day that you heard that Dale was leaving Channel 4 on a Monday to join Channel 8 on a Friday? Well, it was a seismic shift in the local media world. Vern Lundquist, a man of the hour. News 8. Roger, back to throw, has a man open in the end zone, caught, touchdown, drop! 
Vern, who was the channel eight at the time, and he was the big guy in town, he was the man. Vern's reaction was, you're shitting me. We hired Dale Hansen. Well, tomorrow they will start aerobic dance lessons. That'll teach them, won't it? I'm Dale Hansen. I think a lot of people ridicule them. A lot of people roll their eyes. Put yourself in their mindset of hiring this guy who had literally been fired from five of his previous seven jobs. I can't imagine who had the guts or was willing to take that risk, but I sure am glad they did. You remember how he had to fight through that at the beginning? Yeah, because he was good. And he told you he was good. Hope I can do that when I'm 76. Right now, I just want to be 36. Dale realized really early on that giving the ball scores, as he says, and showing highlights were only going to take him so far. He had to have another gear. He had to be Dale. I still remember Dale Hansen countdown when I first came into the league. You start counting down. Michael Jordan is going to be here in six days, and I'm on the phone. Yo, you're going to be here in six days? People say I'm arrogant, controversial, outspoken. I hope they're all right about that, because I'm talking about the things I care about. He's big, he's handsome, and Dale is a bull in a china shop. He's gonna break some stuff. Whatever label you choose to put on me, at least I try to call it the way I see it. This isn't like easy. Uh-huh. Is that your letter? The one in your left hand, really specifically. The one in the left hand, specifically, with your initials on the SMU station. That stationary. is mine, yes. What really launched Dell onto the scene as someone that was serious about his craft was the SMU investigation. People forget that. SMU has received the toughest penalty ever given a major college football program. He was willing to allow the facts to take them where they led, but it damn sure credentialed him as someone willing to speak truth to power. And everybody was lamenting the death penalty, the death penalty, the death penalty, you know. And then all of a sudden, Dale Hansen popped up on the screen, and he says, well, you know, uh, uh, they do kill you in Texas. And I mean, the minute I heard that, I just spit out my food because I was eating while watching it. I just spit out the food laughing, said, laughing so hard because, first of all, it was true. Secondly, it was funny. And thirdly, it was direct and to the point. Super Bowl 27 in Pasadena, California. I'm Dale Hansen along with Brad Cam at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena on an absolutely glorious day. And fumble! And Leon Red oh, oh, to the 20! Oh, Go oh, Leon! Oh, it's a fumble! He had it knocked out of his hand! It's not gonna be a touchdown! Oh, Leon! <laughs> yeah, he's laughing about it now, Leon, but 40 years from now when we... You can't fake it. The audience can tell. And our chemistry, Dale's and mine, was instant and authentic. You've been waiting to see me fired. This might be the show to do it. I'm having a little trouble giving Cowboys owner Jerry Jones credit for fixing the mess he himself created. Does it bother you to fire coaches and players who, who, who don't do their job well enough when you don't fire the general manager who fails at his job? Well, the good news is I haven't had to run off five or six general managers. <laughs> People just don't realize how difficult it is to work and live in Dallas and regularly push back on not only the Cowboys, but Jerry Jones. I was in Austin, Texas, uh, Cowboy training camp. I was standing there just by happenstance, and, and all of a sudden they're going at it. You've got dissension among your staff. Oh, you I know really what do. you're talking about. You've got well, guys maybe I fabricate don't. Oh, we, we make it all up. You do, you do. What? You're the guy that told us last <laughs> week, walked up to Jerry. No, do me a favor. You, you said that Tony Casillas had a brain tumor. I yes, did not tell him that. Jerry now, wait a minute. If you're you did. I did not, yes, I did you not do that. I asked you the question. Right? When Barry Switzer sat there and pounded on Dale's arm. Dale's thought was, well, this is great TV. My dad said I'd never make it big in broadcasting and look at me now. That's the price we pay to live in a free society. But when we cancel games because we're afraid to live, the bad guys win. Their ignorance perpetuates the stereotype of all of us in Texas. If you don't think white privilege is a fact, you don't understand America. I don't understand his world, but I do understand that he's part of mine. Never has such a big man looked so small in the eyes of a little boy. When he talks about his relationship with his father, mm -hmm. he's going in places a lot of people won't go. No question, and uh, he humanizes himself. He's making a difference that, that, quite frankly, not many people could. The technical 
ability to craft, to write, to use the written and spoken word, it's an art. He's a brilliant writer, and that's his genius. He just knew. Perhaps the greatest compliment I could give you is when a young sportscaster asks me for advice, I always tell him, go to YouTube, watch Dale Hansen. Because he's the most unlikely viral internet star of all time, because he really doesn't know what the words viral or internet mean. Here's a scary thought. What if we're sitting here 30 years from today, and then we find out that these are the good old days? And here we sit, witnesses to a lifetime time lapse, watching a man always predicting the future. So it's hard to imagine that this is it. When he walks off that set for the last time, there's no hitting rewind and doing it all over again. But there are still wrongs to right, truths to be told, and air to breathe. If it was a Hollywood movie, people would, wouldn't believe it. I just really hope that people understand how much he cared about doing the job right. To stay at one place for 38 years says he's done the right thing the right way for that amount of time, and that is genius. Until tomorrow. For everyone who's been a part of this one, I'm Dale Hansen. We do thank you for watching. Good night. Coming up next, Dale Hansen goes from interviewer to the interviewee, and Mark Cuban has the honor of asking the questions. Well, this ought to be interesting. No, it'll be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> You know how many interviews Dale has done in the five decades he's been in broadcast? How many people he's had on the hot seat? Hundreds, thousands. So you know what? We decided to flip the script and let one of his biggest targets over the years switch chairs and ask Dale the questions. So, Mr. Hansen. Yes, sir. The tables are finally turned <laughs> and I could not be happier. Uh -huh. So are you ready for this? I'm ready for okay, it. Okay, we're gonna go way, way back. So you grew up in Western Iowa. I right? did. What did you wanna be when you grew up? I wanted to be a disc jockey. That's all I wanted to be, was just that smart aleck disc jockey, uh, spinning records. I grew up in this little town of Logan, Iowa, never thinking it was possible, quite honestly. But I think the real motivation was Johnny Carson's grandparents lived right across the street from me. Every afternoon, Mrs. Carson, uh -huh. and that's all I ever knew her by, Mrs. Carson would, would bring all of us neighbor kids in for lemonade and cookies, and, and Johnny had a show called Who Do You Trust? <laughs> And we just thought the woman was batty. You know, we, we thought she was nuts because nobody in Logan, Iowa has a grandson like Johnny Carson. Of course. But the lemonade and cookies were incredible. <laughs> <laughs> when he got to Tonight Show, Johnny Carson. Johnny Mrs. Carson was in a nursing home and, uh, in Blair, Nebraska, and Johnny would actually stop in Omaha, secretly stop. Uh -huh. My mom was a hairdresser, would go over and fix Mrs. Carson's hair. I, I, I wanted to be Johnny Carson, quite honestly, but that was a bit unrealistic. But a disc jockey I thought was possible, and eventually I did. You want to be a disc jockey? Yeah. Were you like the kid that was the jock and like working for the school radio because that was the pro the progression? I got very involved in, in, in speech classes, in the class plays. I was in drama. I wait, had, wait, yeah, wait, 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 I wait, wait. In drama, <laughs> Dale Hansen? Yeah, one of my all-time favorite moments. I was the uh, escapee from an insane asylum. <laughs> okay, stop there. Typecasting. <laughs> Typecasting <laughs> kind of type best. You're into drama and, yeah. you, and you can act, right? So... What's the next step on that path? My parents didn't believe I could do this. Uh -huh. uh, my friends didn't believe I could do this. So I went straight to the Navy at 17 years old. Oh, wow. But I got out of the Navy. I had four jobs bouncing around. How long were you in? Three years. Three years. Then I started the, the, the chase of just going from odd job to odd job to odd job. Finally, this Frank Wyman, who was my English and drama teacher, right. said, you've always wanted to be on the radio. Why aren't you doing it? 
So I went to a broadcasting school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and so here wait, wait. I am. So what? Yeah. Which broadcasting school? Career Academy. Okay, so people. A lot yeah. of people probably don't realize. Back uh, in the day, yeah. every other ad on the radio yeah. was, yeah. "You can be a broadcaster." Yeah. The yeah. Columbia <laughs> School of Broadcasting, right? So you went to one of those schools. I did. No, the reality was, I was late at night. I'm unemployed. The guy comes on the radio, just like you said, it was on all the time. If you sound like this, you can make millions of dollars in the fabulous world of broadcasting. And I'm thinking, I think I sound like you that. You do sound like that. Yeah. But I knew this was like my last shot, right? I mean, I, I had failed in all these other jobs. Right. And this Iowa radio station, KCOB, calls up. They're looking for a disc jockey. Uh -huh. $94 a week. All my life, I wanted to be a disc jockey. I finally get that job. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking, this is the worst job in America. <laughs> it's Newton, Iowa. So you don't know if anybody's listening. There's no feedback. I mean, there's nobody in the building, basically, but right. me. I'm thinking, this was my whole life. This is everything I've dreamed about being. Right. And now I know I can't do this either. And it sucks. I can't do this either. <laughs> okay. And so, that was kind of scary. So then what happens scary. next? And again, I've always been in the right spot at the right time. A guy named Dave Reek was the news anchor, the newscaster for the radio station. He up and quit. John Carl, the owner of the station, said, I know you hate spinning records. You got a halfway decent voice. You read well. You, read you want well. to be the news guy. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I'll do Why it. Why not? And I'm telling you, Mark, I've never enjoyed anything more in my life. That, that proverbial light bulb didn't go off. It just exploded. That's awesome. It just exploded. 1974, on a 1,000-watt daytime radio station, I was chosen or elected, however you decide that, uh, the Iowa Associated Press Investigative Reporter of the Year. So you go from Newton to Knoxville to St. Cloud, Minnesota. Yeah. How do you find your way to Dallas? That is a story that still I find hard to believe. Uh, I, I was fired at Coil Radio in Omaha, Nebraska, and I just walked in the door uh, of KMTV in Omaha, called them up, said, can I interview? They said, sure, come on in. And on my sainted mother's grave, this is how lucky I've been in my life. As I'm sitting there, after being told that I can't work there because I don't have a college degree, the phone rings and Dave Weber, the weekend sportscaster at KMTV in Omaha, quit. quits. Yeah. And Mark Gutier, the news director, was so angry and so frustrated, he looks at me and he goes, hey, kid, do you like sports? And I'm like, I love sports. And I'm just looking for a job. Right, I mean, going, and he goes, how would you like to be the weekend sportscaster? And I said, you, but you said everybody who works here has to have a college degree. And he goes, no, nah, not to be a sports guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that to be true. Yeah, I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you don't need any education at all. And I auditioned for the job, and, and I get hired. And again, never thinking that I'd leave Omaha, Nebraska. I get fired in Omaha, Nebraska. I get hired in Dallas, Texas. I get fired in Dallas, Texas. And I end up at Channel 8. Boy too, buddy. Channel 8. You go to Channel 8, but you have to have a conversation, right? Dale, here's what we yeah. want, or Dale, just be yourself. What, what was that like? I had gone through a lot of different jobs trying to be what I thought they wanted me to right. be. That almost never works. Right. And I finally decided I want this job desperately. I need that job right. desperately. And I then laid out my plan as to how I would do it, keeping in mind that it's not the way they had been doing it. Cowboys coach Tom Landry saying the other day it was time to get tough with this ball club, that three losses in the NFC title game was enough. Well, tomorrow they will start aerobic dance lessons. That'll teach them, won't it? I would do a lot of funny stories. Here he comes, and there he goes. Channel 8 Sports in thousand dollars. I wouldn't do a lot of human interest stories. Right. I would cover high school sports, which I was doing at Channel 4, right. but they didn't do it at Channel 8 at that time. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm laying this whole spiel out that this is how I will do it. And I'll never forget, uh, as arrogant as this may be, Marty Haig looks at me and says, you know, our consultants have been telling us that for quite a while. 
And I looked at him, I said, you've got very good consultants. Smart consultants, right? <laughs> I don't certainly don't look at you as a traditional sportscaster. I hope not. No, I mean, no, I hope not. look, we've had our battles over the years, yeah, right? You're yeah. not shy, you, you have an opinion, and, yeah. and I've never had a problem with it because you never had a problem no. with me fighting back. But see, I like opinionated people. I yeah. mean, I gravitate toward opinionated people. I think you do too in yeah. many ways. Yeah. But the thing that I've always liked about you, and, and quite honestly, Jerry Jones, which surprises a lot of people, I would knock you down. I would make some smart aleck remark about your team or whatever. Of course. Uh, you never came to the games, and I would give no, you a hard time about that. I used but... to. I went to. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you're like 40 <laughs> yards now, too far to walk. But I, I, I always had these opinions that, that obviously some owners, some don't players agree don't with, like. Yeah. Some players, okay, I'm never talking to you again. Some owners would take that approach. Uh, Jerry Jones never has, and I respect that yeah. a great deal. Uh, you and I have battled, but I'm not afraid of the battle either. No, you that's know? what I like about you. This is what I believe. This is what I'm going to say. I have this platform. Now, I, and do I not? I give you the opportunity to, to explain it from your Sometimes, point of view. Sometimes, but it's okay, right? Yeah, you'll I, take... I, eventually, it, it is my show. <laughs> <laughs> At no, the end of the day, it is yeah, my show. I'll tell you, it's my team, right? <laughs> so I get that choice, too. So... All the years, all yeah. the battles, what stands out? The battles don't really stand out to me because I don't think they were that bad. But, but what really stands out is all the good times. I'm from Logan, Iowa. It's a population of like 11, 1,200 people, maybe. Right. That's counting a lot of the tombstones. <laughs> Never went to college. Fired eight times. And I'm sitting outside the arena in Miami while the Mavericks are winning the NBA championship. I'm in Pasadena, California, broadcasting from the Rose Bowl because the Cowboys have just won the championship. Yep. I'm at St. Louis because the Rangers are in the World Series. The Stars are having this Stanley yep. Cup parade through Dallas. In Dallas, those are the memories that I'll always, always, as long as I can remember anything. Right. Because it's, I mean, so many incredible good times. In everybody's career, and here you are coming from Newton, Iowa, right? Mm -hmm. There's an inflection point. But now you're in the big time, right? You're you're here in Dallas in Channel 8, and you've got a much, much bigger audience. What was the inflection point there? What was the one story that you felt just propelled you? Oh, I don't think there's any question. Um, it, it was the SMU investigation. This is the News 8 Update. Channel 8 News has learned the NCAA is once again investigating the football program at Southern Methodist University. That 86-87 cycle with, with all the cheating that was going on yeah. in the Southwest Conference. Dale is here now with this exclusive report. John, the SMU football program is in the second year of its current probation for violating NCAA rules, but three weeks ago, NCAA investigator James Butch Worley talked to former SMU linebacker David Stanley. Stanley is telling the NCAA that SMU continued to pay him to play football after the August 85 sanctions. People tend to forget this now, but I, I was primarily the, the cheerleading sportscaster. Right. SMU changed almost everything about me. The SMU football program could be subject to further sanctions, possibly including the NCAA's so-called death penalty. From that point forward, I really did start to look at all of sports with a bit of a jaundiced eye. Is that your letter? I didn't find uh, that, that same typical enthusiasm, that, right. that blind loyalty that right. I, I'm pretty sure you're happy that so many fans have. When, when that SMU story popped, uh -huh. uh, and again, just came from a phone call, like so many good stories do. So yeah, do. Don't start with yeah. the genesis of that. Just a yeah. phone call, someone just- Just a phone call. Uh, as, as Bob Hitch, the athletic director said, you're, you're taking the word of a disgruntled uh, employee. Which I'm sure she was. Right. That's the key to me is we didn't just take her word for it. Right. We spent months investigating to make sure that that story checked out. But that's when everything changed. Uh, I mean, from that day forward, right. Um, uh, right or wrong, I was no longer the cheerleading sportscaster. SMU has received the toughest penalty ever given a major college football program. The NCAA announcing this morning no football in 87, seven road games in 88, no scholarships till then, and then only 15. I, I've had a lot of calls on a lot of different stories that I, I swear to you, my first reaction is, I hope this isn't true. Um, but I never shy away from the story. Well, you, know? you certainly don't shy away. So let's, let's pop yeah. forward a little bit. Right. 
to, from SMU to the Cowboys and your good buddy Barry Switzer. <laughs> the Cowboys coach Barry Switzer joins me here tonight. Tell uh, us what happened there. Oh, my gosh. I, I picked the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl on the radio that day, but I also knew that Barry was having some issues uh -huh. with his assistant coaches. I never said, nor is anybody saying, that an assistant coach has a problem with Barry Switzer. What I'm saying, and what a lot of players are saying, and what a lot of coaches are saying, that assistant coaches are having problems with assistant coaches, and players want you to step up and stop. I think, I think you don't don't know what you're talking about, and they don't either, Dale Hanson. There is no problem here on this staff in the Dallas Cowboys. I promise you that. And I think, as an owner, you've probably been through this one oh, time yeah, or another. Of course. When a head coach, like in this case, inherits the entire staff, that's not the most conducive way to run a railroad. It's tough, yeah. And it's tough. It can be very tough, but sometimes it does work out that way. And especially when you're bringing in Barry Switzer, they needed to do it that way. Right. I told that story that Barry, behind the scenes, is having a lot of issues. And the next thing I know, Barry's punching me in the arm and calling me a liar. Because I can go back and sit on my couch any day because I came to Dallas <laughs> with more money than Jimmy left with. But what really pushed me over the limit was I was working on a story, never reported it, that Tony Casillas had a brain tumor. I'd been get a phone call. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I'm checking it out. And on the air, Barry Switzer says, You're the guy who told us last week, walked up to Jerry. No, do me a you, favor. You said that Tony Casillas had a brain tumor. I you never guys, said You guys manufacture everything. Oh, I got a radiologist and just saw the, the, the film. You guys manufacture everything. Did you ever see that story on the air? No, or in but print you walked over and told Jerry that. You I did not tell him that. I did not tell him that. Now, wait a minute. If you're you did. I did not. Yes, I did not do that. Did. And then... It got crazy. I did not. Did you tell someone? I did not tell anybody. Oh, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. I did not tell anybody. Oh, no, wait a minute, Barry. A I'm going to give you the form. I'm giving you the form, but let's play fair. I did not tell anybody any such thing. I ask a lot of questions. I ask a lot of tough questions. I try to ask tough questions. Well, that, yeah, but you were false I, I think about that. You now, get, I didn't ask. Now I, you I, never about, you I never reported that. I never reported that. I never reported that. Coaching staff has decisions. It, 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 just, it was the beginning of the year. So what's your relationship yeah. with Barry right now? I haven't talked to him since then. Wow. Never have, nor do I want to. I, I think it was the classic Jones case of, of, of let me slap Jimmy Johnson in the face by hiring Barry Switzer. I think, it, was, I, I think it, was, it, it wasn't a football decision. It was a personal decision. What would be the most insulting thing I could do to Jimmy Johnson? And that would be to hire Barry Switzer. I'll let Jerry know. respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go in the middle. Okay, so let's let's get yeah. into something a little bit different. Let's let's just play rapid fire. What's okay. the first thing that comes to your mind? Roger Staubach. Roger Staubach is the greatest human being superstar I've ever met. I've always had this theory that I know a great number of, of, of superstar athletes, yep. right? I know a great number of superstar human beings. Mm -hmm. Very seldom do they cross. Very seldom do they cross. Roger Staubach is the epitome of that. He's a good man. What about Nolan Ryan? Nolan Ryan, I think, is a great superstar. I, I thought in many ways he was overrated uh, as, a, uh, as an executive with the Rangers. I'm starting to rethink that a little bit. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's hard to still think that way. Yeah. You know, I, I'm never quite convinced he understands that he's Nolan Ryan. I mean, I, I, think, there, I think he does have a certain part of him, but, but he was always so down to earth. Okay, Rolando Blackman. Oh, I, oh my gosh. Rolando Blackman was my first real connection to the NBA. Uh -huh. uh, Rolando Blackman, to me, was the epitome of draining every, every ounce, ounce of talent he yeah. had into the work ethic and the style. Yep. And um, just classic, a great human classic. Yeah. One of my good friends, Mike Madonna. The first hockey game I went to, I'm sitting on the glass with my wife. He's in a face-off, uh -huh. and he winks at us. He winks at us. <laughs> right so before Mike. They, and everybody that thought, is so Mike. As, as the puck's getting ready to drop, he looks up, sees me sitting there with my wife, and he just kind of winks. You sure and, it wasn't because there, there wasn't a hot girl sitting next well, to you? Well, yeah, that's also true. <laughs> he, and I, uh, he, he and I had better times um, on the street than we ever did uh, in the arena. He's a good man. But yeah. man, oh man, is he special. Troy Aikman. Well, now he, he probably is the most special guy I've known because, again, of the superstar status the human being, and the relationship that I built probably went too far. I, I probably got too close because I've right. always been the self-proclaimed president of the Troy Aikman fan club. 
But I think if you'll look back at my broadcast, and I, there are several instances I can give you, I was too hard on Eggman just to prove that I wasn't the president of his fan club. And I'm guessing you guys are still friends? Oh, very much so. Good. Yeah, good. very Troy's much so. He, he went back to Logan, uh, which is the coolest thing I've ever seen uh, a great athlete do. I went back to my high school graduation. I was given a little money in Frank Weiland's name. Uh -huh. And I mentioned that, hey, I, I, I've been to the NBA championships. I've been to the Super Bowls. I've been to all this. And, oh, by the way, Troy Aikman's a friend of mine. And the place just goes nuts. So the next year, Troy went back. Oh, and we cool. snuck him in. And I'm on the stage getting ready to give the money to these kids. And I said, I told last year's class, Troy Aikman's a friend of mine. I said, hey, Troy, are you a friend of mine? I thought the building was going to come down. That's awesome. Aikman walks out. And for two days, he had said to me, I don't have to talk here, right? I said, no, no, you don't have to say a word. He walks up to me, he said, you want me to say something? I said, if you want. He blew those kids out of the chairs, talking about the fact that he's from Henrietta, Oklahoma, yep. and people told him he could not live out his dreams, but he didn't listen. And every kid in that building was ready to take on the world when Troy Aikman got done talking. Um, I, I, I love that guy. I absolutely love that guy. Jerry Jones. Believe it or not, I like the man a great deal. Um, I, I wish he wasn't the general manager of my favorite football team. <laughs> I wish he could have found happiness in being the owner of the football team. At the same time, I know how generous he is. Yep. I know what he does for people behind the scenes, yep. that he doesn't beg for the publicity that he could indeed get. Yep. And as I've said a thousand times, the fact that some of the things I say about Jerry Jones, and he always shows up on Sunday nights to do the interviews when I need him. Yep. Um, that, that's pretty classy. I'm only asking this next one because they're telling me I have to. Mark Cuban. As you said in the very beginning of this sit down, you and I butted heads pretty good. We also go back further than some people would, right. would remember. Yeah, right. And not even that you and I care to yeah, remember right. anymore. <laughs> I enjoy strong people. I, I don't, I'm not afraid of strong people. No, you're I'm not. not afraid of people who don't like me nope. or argue back with me. I think people think that I have this presence. Well, you have to agree with everything. No, please. No. And you certainly never shied away. No, never, you know? right? You never shied away. Yeah. And believe it or not, I respect the heck out of it. You know, the way I, I always know. looked at it was the more someone came back at me, the more reason I had to engage with them, right? Because it made it interesting. Absolutely. There's yeah. nothing worse than the I, same I old questions all the time. I don't like people in my booth at a bar. I don't like people on my patio uh, with a drink in their hand who agree with everything I say. No. Because then the conversation just pretty much it's runs boring. itself out. It you is know? boring. I just wish, quite honestly, that, uh, I don't even know if you remember this or not, but I just wish my single biggest regret of my life is that when I got a call asking me to invest in something called broadcast.com, <laughs> I would have taken the time to figure out just what it was. I remember that, actually. Instead of saying... That makes no sense to me. And hanging Nobody up the in the phone. world knew what streaming was. We no, were the first no. ones to do streaming. I, I could have been rich. You could have been. I could have been rich. I'll never forget it, actually. We went to two people. So we were audio net at <sighs> the time. Nobody knew what streaming was. Right. And we wanted to get somebody with a presence that had a following. Yeah. We went to Craig James and we went to you. <laughs> right? Craig James had a meeting. Frank Zaccanelli was his agent. And he goes, no, you got to get more. And, and Craig James, I tell him to this day, that 2% that would have been worth, you know, oh, $100 million. No. I mean, yeah. No. We would have given you more. <laughs> 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 200 million, cut, cut, 300 cut, yeah. million. We won't stand quietly by anymore. We won't condone it anymore. We won't look the other way anymore. We won't defend you anymore. We won't listen to your excuses anymore, and we will not accept it anymore. There's been a a fascinating evolution of, of Dale Hansen. Now you're Dale Hansen unplugged. What, what does that mean to you? That means everything to me. Um, that, that's the only thing I, I, I want to be. Uh, that's, right. um, even, even the lovely Mrs. Hansen gets upset when I say this, but you know, I, I don't really care if, if Luka Doncic gets his new contract. Uh, uh, I don't care that much about Dak Prescott's shoulder. I'm sure he's going to be fine. Right. Um, I, I don't care if the Rangers win or lose. I just don't. But when a commentary comes to me, and I know I have the ability to make people react to those commentaries, uh, that, that's everything to me. 
Kids have to be taught to hate, and it's our parents and grandparents, and our teachers and coaches too, who teach us to hate. Kids become the product of that environment. I was, and they are. It's not sports driven at all. You know, it's really- Well, it used to be. That's, that, that's the good and the bad of it. Okay. I've, I've been writing commentaries in one fashion or another, back into the 80s. And right. I mean, the first real uh, commentary that I wrote was around the SMU investigation. We have called this an American sports tragedy, and it is. And then I started writing commentaries, always sports related. Even well into my 60s, while people really didn't notice until social media came along, I, I was still always having a sports hook. I don't care how good he is. I don't care if the Cowboys made a great deal. And I absolutely don't care about the argument so many of you make that what he does off the field just doesn't matter if he can help you win on the field. Is there no line you won't cross? Is there no crime you won't accept? Is there no behavior you will not tolerate? And then the commentary that obviously set me on an entirely different course was Michael Sand. Right. You beat a woman and drag her down a flight of stairs, pulling her hair out by the roots, you're the fourth guy taken in the NFL draft. You kill people while driving drunk, that guy's welcome. Players caught in hotel rooms with illegal drugs and prostitutes, we know they're welcome. Players accused of rape and pay the woman to go away. You lie to police trying to cover up a murder, we're comfortable with that. You love another man, well now you've gone too far. But here again, <laughs> it's why I, I, I do, despite how arrogant and egotistical I supposedly am. You and, are. Well, probably. <laughs> I'm so arrogant. That's not necessarily well, bad, I'm so arrogant and egotistical, I don't think I am. Right? <laughs> That's how arrogant. But, but this is how I do know for a fact I've just been in the right place at the right time. That Michael Sam commentary was written primarily because we didn't have a reporter available the next day. And I had to fill the time. I'm not always comfortable when a man tells me he's gay. I don't understand his world, but I do understand that he's part of mine. The question that comes from that, is that the real Dale Hansen? Is, is that who you've been all this time and that gave you the chance to really release it? I mean, yeah. it's hard to be that kid in a small town. I wasn't that kid in a small town. I went to the Navy and that's when everything changed for me politically, uh, socially, socially right. because then I got exposed to all these different people, all these different cultures, and, and I changed. From that day forward, I've always been that same guy. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I only write what I believe, and, and that is me, and it does allow me, and I'll always be grateful for Channel 8 giving me that platform to write about gay rights and, and, and civil rights and social issues. And then, and then when, it, it, when it went to the next level, was, was the police shooting in Dallas five yeah. years ago? Yeah. And Mike Devlin was our general manager because every commentary, every unplug that I did always had a sports hook. And, and Mike Devlin called me early in the morning after the, the, the police shooting right. and said, I want you to write about that tonight at 10. And I said, well, I, I can't write about that. And he goes, well, you write about social issues all the right. time. I said, yeah, but, but there's always a sports hook. And he goes, well, you don't need a sports hook. I want you to write about this. And I thought about it all day and, and then I finally wrote it, and I think it's one of the best things I've ever written, quite frankly. We'll fly our flags at half-mast, we'll say all the right things, we'll make promises we won't keep, and then nothing will change. Our lives will go on while the lives of so many others won't, because we expect it now and we accept it. It wasn't this way when I was a boy, but it is life in America now. America's problem has come to Dallas now, and our lieutenant governor blames the peaceful protesters because our lieutenant governor is a fool. As we reach different levels of accomplishment in our careers, mm -hmm. right, we hope we gain wisdom, you know, through we all hope. these years. Um, what's the wisdom of Dale Hansen? Well, I, I do hope and I do think that, that my wisdom is that there's, there's always a better day coming. I know for a fact families have a great deal more issues of course. than I've ever had. Of course. But no matter what that issue is, I never give up. I just don't allow people to tell me what I can achieve. No. what I can do. What I've heard in all this, and, and I've really enjoyed this, thank yeah. you, is you know, hope and effort. That if you have hope and you put in the effort, yep. anything is possible. And that's gotten to you to this incredible level of accomplishment. How do you want to be remembered? I do want to be remembered as the guy who tried to make it a little bit better place for his granddaughter. I don't care if there's a marker in the ground um, and somebody walks by, I don't care if they say, did you ever see that man on TV? He was funny, he was clever, he was opinionated. 
Uh, did you ever know about the awards that he won or the games he covered? I want people to walk by and say, you ever, you ever met that man's daughter? Yeah. That man's daughter's a teacher. Mm -hmm. You ever met that man's granddaughter? She's a teacher, and she's a black woman in America. And that's what Dale Hansen did. Dale Hansen made it a little bit better, a little bit better. Not nearly as much as the dreams that I had when I was a boy. In the 60s, we thought the world was coming apart at the seams, mm -hmm. and my generation was going to change the world. My generation was going to stop the wars that made no sense. Yep. My generation was going to stop the discrimination against our people based on their religion or their skin color. And my generation knew that the richest country in the world would never allow somebody to go to bed hungry without a roof over their head. And 55 years later, we're coming out of our longest war, which in a country that most people can't find on a map, nor do they know why we were there. We discriminate, discriminate against our people every day. And we've got people all over America going to bed hungry, sleeping on our streets without a roof over their head. That crushes me. That crushes me that my dream of a boy is never going to come true in my lifetime. And then as soon as I start to think about it, I realize my daughter's a teacher. My granddaughter's a black woman and a teacher. And I know what they're doing. Right. And they're going to drag us forward. They're going to keep dragging us forward. And I hope, uh, as I like to say, which some people don't necessarily like, but I do, I've never wanted to make America great again. I've always wanted to make America as great as I know it can be. Yeah. And that's all I've ever tried to do. <laughs> you stopped at a Johnny on the spot in downtown St. Louis. With my cashmere coat. Uh, I mean, I was incredibly bloated. I was incredibly sick. But I looked really good. <laughs> you uh, did, you walking did. into the Johnny on the spot. <laughs> and thank goodness it was there. I first came to WFAA as chief meteorologist in 2005. And I really didn't know who Dale was. But I quickly found out. Boy, did I ever. I'll never forget this. The first time I saw you, I, I'm, I'm in the studio, and John and Gloria had described, you know, who you were. And I thought, well, I, 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 I honest to God. So they all describe you, and I'm like, God didn't make anybody like that. You then walked into the studio, and I mean, with all your bluster and everything, really? and I thought... I like this guy. <laughs> yeah. Dale, a big race uh, Sunday. It looks like it could yeah. be a wet one. Ah, well, again, I'm not going to be there, so I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> this guy is so full of yeah. crap. Yep. I yep, mean, yep, this, yep. Is this is going to be a lot of fun. Well, I, I knew this is what Kathy uh, Clemens did say to me. She said, it would be fun. She goes, you're going to really love this guy because you were that guy that played along. We were watching the CMAs, and Dale said, you know, I, I don't even recognize this country I music. I I mean, I just don't. Well, I did. I, I like, <laughs> I, this is true, I like country music, and I tuned over tonight thinking the Country Music Awards was on, and twice I had to go back, because I knew that wasn't it. Years ago, when I started this, you know, I wanted to be a sports cat. Yeah, yeah you've been trying ever since you got here well, to take yeah, my I job. Have, I, mean, I have. We talked to the great uh, DeMarcus Ware tonight at 10. Shelly, John? Oh, oh hello! Oh, no, no! <laughs> Delcus is out here, and if I have any luck at all, that, that little uh, hey. dinner thing that he's on will, you will sink you here pretty quick. You How did I possibly think he would miss my birthday? <laughs> I, at first, I, I, I'll be honest with you, there was a part of me like, huh, what, what's this guy doing? But when you came to California with the Cowboys, you remember the time you snuck up behind me? Oh my gosh. Uh, no, no, there's no. Did sport. you? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was so oh. funny because Sean Hamilton's like, he goes, I thought you were going to kill him. He <laughs> goes, because I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Oh, I, I, you startled him so much. And you know, what Sean, want, what Sean wanted me to do, he wanted me to put the Rowdy costume on. <laughs> Did you know that? He no. wanted me to put Rowdy on and just come up and surprise you and take the head yeah, off. Yeah, but see, people don't understand what a professional I am. <laughs> I'm getting ready for my birthday. Sean's making sure that my attention is focused straight ahead. As you're coming up the entire football field, you jump up and grab me in the dark 
and I had to go change my pants. <laughs> we have had some oh, fun trips, the, though. We, we, you know, the, the trip to St. Louis. Of course, that's kind of in your neighborhood oh, yeah, a little yes. bit. Yes. But, the World uh, Series. Yeah. Man, yeah. crawling up inside that, that stupid bridge thing. You oh, know, in the arch? Yeah, it's like three and a half feet high. I don't know how you fit in there. Did they have to butter you up well, and if, squeeze if, you in there? And... If you look, that bridge now has got a few lumps on the outside <laughs> of it. You, know? uh, you remember game six of the World Series? And, and you and I are broadcasting in St. Louis. It's The Rangers are actually going to win the World Series. They're one pitch away in the bottom of the ninth. They're one pitch away. We come all the way down. We had to go across the street because, oh, goodness gracious, Major League Baseball does not want us inside the stadium. We run across the street. We jump up on that. Then we, I'm sorry, what just happened? Oh, well, they tied it up. Let's go back. We go all the way back. Josh Hamilton hits the home run. Oh, my gosh, they're going to win again. We went all the way down. Remember? Yeah. We go back, we get set up. I, I'm sorry, what just happened? We go all the way back. And the guy, remember the red jacket guys, they're ushers. And he goes, buddy, buddy, make up your mind. <laughs> and I thought, if they would. And it was freezing cold. Yep. And we're standing on that flatbed truck. And those are, again, memories that I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I will remember those nights in St. Louis, working with you, laughing with you as long as I can remember anything. Yeah. We've laughed basically from the first time we met, and we've been laughing on the air for 16 years. It has flown by, hasn't it? It's been a pleasure, my friend. It has been all my pleasure, believe me. The Dale Hansen story would make a heck of a movie. It has all of the elements of a blockbuster. Dale? He's the most compelling and entertaining storyteller you'll ever see on local news. Now, Hanson says he has to go, and I know WFAA will survive without him, but I just wish he didn't have to leave. We'll miss the big guy. And I wish we could just hit rewind and do it all over again. So this entire week, we will hit rewind, and we'll share a lot more Dale moments. We'll celebrate him during our newscasts and on WFAA.com slash Dale Retires. And then his final show and commentary this Thursday night at 10 p.m. For everyone who's been a part of this one and Dale Hansen's 38 years at WFAA, I'm Pete Delkus. We do thank you for watching. Thank you, Dale, and good night.